Good evening and welcome to something of a first for television, a programme dedicated to the life and work of Mrs Margaret Thatcher, who uh, many of you may not have noticed has got a book out at the moment. At uh, the launch of Mrs Thatcher, the Downing Street years, a suspicious character is searched going into the hall. <laughs> News footage just in may go some way to explaining why Geoffrey Howe hasn't been seen in public recently. <laughs> and at a beer tasting festival in Devon, Dennis Thatcher forgets himself. <laughs> Our guest this week, two figures who rose to prominence during the Thatcher years with Ian Hislop, the former Labour militant from Liverpool City Council, who said recently, you could put me in a six-foot hole and throw stones at me and I'd still come out saying what I did was right, so if you'd all like to form a queue, <laughs> to welcome Derek Hatton. And on Paul Merton's side, a former Conservative minister who was recently set to appear in a TV ad with a number of Game Boys, that's until she discovered they were just computer toys, <laughs> Edwina Curry. <laughs> so with Mrs Thatcher firmly in our mind, let's part the milky thighs of round one and dabble in uh, something entitled Who Dares Loses. Uh, two bits of vintage news film per team. All they have to do is spot the losers and tell us what they lost. Ian and Derek, here's your uh, assortment of failures. Oh, I don't remember her. <laughs> I remember them well. They're not coming to get you, were they, Derek? <laughs> That's not you again, is it? <laughs> oh, no, no, no. no, no. no, no. Oh, I remember him. He was a friend oh, of yours, wasn't he? Oh, you're the one who remembers him. <laughs> yeah, put that together, and uh, what did you get? Well, you started off with um, Scargill, that fool who said the government was going to close down all the coal mines. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs Thatcher said it was a matter for the coal board, so she used Ian McGregor, that was the chap behind the plastic bag. Uh, <laughs> who was the next loser? Derek. <coughs> no, it wasn't. <laughs> oh! It was Gaddafi, wasn't it? Gaddafi, yes, that was... Gaddafi with that... What's his name? Roger Windsor. Roger Windsor. Roger Windsor, the man. Roger Windsor there was sent over to Gaddafi to beg for money for the miners. Later, Roger Windsor said that Arthur Scargill was a bit of a crook, allegedly. <laughs> and um, people then said that he was in MI6. But um, what do you reckon, Derek? Do you reckon he was a bit bent or what? I reckon, <laughs> I reckon the next one, Neil Kinnock. Now, that's the odd one out. Right. Because all the rest only lost once. <laughs> Yes, well, that would be fine if it were the odd one out round, but unfortunately it's not. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, you are right. Uh, two points. It's all about the coal strike uh, when miners all over the country were prevented from working by uh, flying pickets, uh, bald headed pop stars who did cover versions of Buddy Holly songs. <laughs> Uh, the miners' cause was severely damaged when Scargill's deputy, Roger Windsor, was pictured uh, embracing Colonel Gaddafi on TV. Uh, Windsor was given careful instructions by the Foreign Office on the exact protocol of how to kiss Gaddafi. No tongues, but you can put your hand up his jalaba on the second <laughs> uh, Paul and Edwina, another gaggle of losers for you. Uh, Spencer Tracy. <laughs> Apocalypse Now, yeah. I remember that film. Margaret Thatcher spotting a helicopter and being extremely pleased. Look, a helicopter. <laughs> Miss World Contest, uh, standards drop. Mm -hmm. uh, any idea what it refers back to? The Falklands War. Very good. Is that all you have to say? <laughs> now, who won that? I think we won on, on the away goals rule, didn't we? <laughs> It is the Falklands conflict in 1982. Uh, that's the war we fought in order to prove that disputes shouldn't be settled by force. Uh, in its wake, Mrs Thatcher went on to call an early election and trounce Michael Foote, although just before the Falklands, she'd been shown to be the least popular Prime Minister since opinion polls began. Of course, as we know, that record's since been shattered. <laughs> uh, apparently, Mrs Thatcher was so proud of her role in the campaign that on a tour of Chequers with Andrew Lloyd Webber, she pointed out a chair, saying, this is the chair that I sat in when I decided to sink the Belgrano. The chair was facing in a southwesterly direction and was said to be no threat to the desk. <laughs> Ian and Derek, uh, a brief reminder of the halcyon days of Labour government. <laughs> Copies of Maggie's book. Someone who's read it. <laughs> Someone who hasn't read it. <laughs> and there's a mad cow. <laughs> <laughs>
حکومت کی کیا ہے I think that's the 79 election, when Maggie came to power. And the reason why she was carrying the cow around, of course, was because the cow was no longer needed to provide the milk for the kids that she'd taken away from. <laughs> Who said satire was dead? <laughs> <laughs> Just not very well, that's all. <laughs> uh, in the run-up to the election, Mrs Thatcher threw herself into every photo opportunity, even allowing herself to be wired up to a heart monitoring machine. Heart detecting machine might have been more useful. <laughs> Labour leader Jim Callaghan's campaign was a lesson to all politicians. He refused to pose for photographs, he refused to wear makeup on TV, he never drank, he never smoked, and more importantly, he never won. <laughs> the Daily Mail pinpointed the failings of the Labour leader's campaign, saying Callaghan is old-fashioned and he comes in a brown paper bag. <laughs> Quaint old custom. <laughs> That would have been a photo opportunity. Um, Paul You'd have passed shutter lens, though, wouldn't you? <laughs> Paul and Edwina, another crushing defeat for you. Michael Hesseltine and wife. Oh. Goodbye. <laughs> Hello. Hello. <laughs> and goodbye fairly soon. <laughs> Are we sticking to our original agreement that this would be the only television programme I've been in in ten years where I didn't say anything? Or can I say something now? Uh, yes, please, go ahead. Um, it's an uh, open forum. You know, you know, Thank you. you, you uh, know. <laughs> you, know, you, know you know, Derek and I were at school together. Really? Yeah, we were both at school in Liverpool and I used to have an accent just like him. Can you imagine all that? <laughs> Well, it's, what it's sort of accent is that? <laughs> well, it got me into Oxford. Where did it get you, Derek? Certainly not into Oxford. Ooh. Well, well it's like... an interesting answer. Um... <laughs> now, From a not very yeah. interesting person. <laughs> 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 oh, yeah. yes, we we think the answer to the question well, it kept is... kept him out of jail. <laughs> <laughs> for the moment, for the moment. <laughs> is this the only programme I'm not going to be allowed to have a word in? <laughs> We yes. think it's November 1990, yes, we and, do. It, and we reckon that the real loser was uh, John Major's dentist, because I can't think of any dentist who would want it to be known to the world at large that he put his patient in bed for four days after having a tooth out. Yeah, that wasn't very convincing, was it? Well, Margaret wasn't convinced by it, I can tell you. There, you heard it first on. Have I got news for you? <laughs> yes. John uh, Major, a bit of a phony. <laughs> No, no, he, he... Pretending he had toothache when he should have been supporting Maggie. First time I've ever liked him. <laughs> yes, it is the uh, downfall of Margaret Thatcher in 1990 after being uh, challenged for the party leadership by Michael Heseltine, who heard about her resignation on his way to London Zoo, and out visiting relatives. Um, at the crucial point, uh, John Major conveniently disappeared to the dentist to have some teeth taken out before she kicked them out, presumably. <laughs> Uh, in his diary, Alan Clark complained that she had been brought down by a bolus of wankers. <laughs> nice to know what the collective noun is. Uh... <laughs> After, uh... I always thought it was a cabinet. <laughs> Clark, uh, Clark also attacked the short-sightedness of her enemies. Hardly surprising if that's what they're doing all day. <laughs> Is this with or without the brown paper bag? Uh, Is that what Ian McGregor was doing with the white plastic bag? <laughs> Which unsavoury dip into uh, recent history brings us crashing to the end of round one. And uh, the news, hot off the press, is that uh, both teams have given an equally faultless account of themselves, with Ian and Derek and Paul and Edwina enjoying an almost effortless four. And so to round two, in which we unashamedly unleash our quitometer upon you, a state-of-the-art piece of computer technology that randomly singles out a member of Mrs. Thatcher's cabinet for public humiliation, in much the same way as she used to. Uh, what our panel has to tell us is what prompted their completely unprompted resignation, and for extra brownie points, uh, when did it happen? One quitter per person, Paul. Stand by to be wowed by the quitometer. Are you, are you trying to 
break into the Nintendo market. <laughs> a new arcade game. Um, well, who was that? Norman Tebbit. Um, uh, he, well, there was this rumour that he'd had sex with a polar bear. <laughs> no, he left after the election. He did? After the 87 election. There was, um, there was a bit of a to-do, actually, um, between him and Mrs Thatcher, because he was meant to win the election. And she uh, did it. And she did it all on her own. Yeah. Just up to the end, it looked like they might not do it. So she wobbled. And they'd run this brilliant advertising campaign that said, the Tories are really great. Um, <laughs> was that a Saatchi and Saatchi run? I think that was Saatchi, which didn't mm. work. So she called in some other guys, the last minute, who did another brilliant campaign saying, the Tories are really great. <laughs> and then they won. Yes. Yes, I, I, I'll, I'll give uh, yeah, one to each of you. Uh, fed up as well, because he knew that he wasn't going to be the boss, because she was going to go on forever. Is this more dirt? <laughs> yeah, kind of so he that. wanted to be prime minister. I reckon. Well, it... but he didn't have the skirt and the twin set. Yeah. <laughs> he could have done. He didn't quite have the looks, so, you know. But... I'm sure he could have got uglier. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, well, one point each. I mean, Margaret then. Thatcher really is no oil painting, is she? <laughs> <laughs> Something by Picasso, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> it, is, uh, it is Norman Tebbit uh, who fell out with Mrs Thatcher during the 87 election after she accused his campaigning style of being too abrasive. That's like being accused of being too bald by Duncan Goodhue. <laughs> uh, one of Tebbit's favourite targets was the BBC. And in 1986, he demanded a review of inefficient managerial practices at the corporation, uh, which we received a memo about this morning, in fact. Uh, Edwina, eyes peeled as we roll the quitometer. <laughs> <laughs> he is Michael Barrymore. <laughs> One day. Uh, that is the chap who's now known as uh, Lord Howe, and was then known as Sir Geoffrey Howe, and he was the last man out. Uh, he left in about November 1990, and it was partly because she kept shouting at him in the cabinet and trying to make a fool of him. More dirt. <laughs> <laughs> I think he had his trousers on at that time. He right. was the chap that left his trousers on train at one stage. What he was doing without his trousers has never been told, and I'm not telling. Oh, go on. <laughs> Were you on the train? <laughs> It is, uh, it's Geoffrey Howe who stepped down from the cabinet in 1990 with what was described in the Financial Times as something of an uncharacteristic bang. Must have got the idea from Cecil Parkinson. <laughs> uh, uh, Michael Heseltine said he'd only stand against Maggie in unexpected circumstances and Howe's departure provided him with precisely the unexpected circumstances he'd been expecting. <laughs> Uh, in his early days, Howe used to be known as Mogadon Man and Dead Sheep, but he's calmed down a lot since then. <laughs> uh, Derek, your turn to ride the quitometer. <laughs> Didn't get any better, did it? It's a lovely Cecil, isn't it? Cecil Parkinson. Of course, Cecil Parkinson, a lot of people don't know, was actually a joiner prior to him going to the Parliament. And he was actually going to go back to that when he lost his position in the Cabinet. But he learned a very valuable lesson while he was there, that one loose screw collapsed the cabinet. <laughs> it's not working. <laughs> I've cut to the song. <laughs> um, yes, yes it is, of course, uh, Cecil Parkinson, whose uh, promising political career was ruined in 1983. Up to that point, some party bigwigs were even mentioning him in the context of a possible future prime minister. The context being, there's no way this man's a possible future prime minister. <laughs> uh, Mrs Thatcher often impressed on Cecil the importance of Victorian values, but getting a servant pregnant and trying to keep it quiet weren't quite the ones she had in mind. <laughs> and uh, finally, in this round, Ian, let's see what uh, hapless victim, the quitometer, has in store for you. <laughs> <laughs> Can you zap me? Well, that's Nigel Lawson. Is correct. And um, he left just before how? in 89. Yes. And she had an economic advisor called Sir Alan Walters, who um, used to write pieces in obscure magazines saying Lawson's an idiot. Um, <laughs> and Lawson eventually went to Maggie, very firm, and he said, either Walters goes or I do. And she said, bye. <laughs> A perfect answer. It is Nigel Lawson, who resigned in 1989 after Mrs Thatcher uh, refused his demands to sack her advisor, uh, Sir Alan Walters. He says it was a predicament he accepted without rancour or a bolus of rankers, madame. 
which uh, weighty topic brings us to the end of this round of technical wizardry and uh, all the indications are that uh, well Paul and Ed Wiener are beginning to lag with seven whilst Ian and Derek are edging into a nervous lead with nine Well, time now for the undignified euphoria that is round three, as the familiar sight of our odd one out round hoves into view. Four Thatcher favourites, which one is the Ted Heath? <laughs> Paul, um, here's your uh, selection of misfits. John Stalker. Herself. Snooker's Ray Reardon. <laughs> and Dave D, out of Dave D, Dozy Beaky Making Church. Um, John Stalker is the only one who advertises metal blinds for your house, because they're a very good deterrent against burglary, so he says. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I, I must have missed that one. Have you it was it? offered no. to you, Angus, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dave D. Dozy, Beaky McIntitch had a hit with In Xanadu, and there was a whiplash in the middle of it. Well, and they're the only ones who've had a hit with yep. Xanadu. <laughs> um, the answer is that all of them except Mrs Thatcher have been policemen. Uh, former police chief John Stalker was in charge of security for Mrs Thatcher's book, large chunks of which were then leaked to the Daily Mirror. <laughs> He's uh, since been offered a top job with Group 4. Uh, Ray Reardon said of his days on the beat, it's surprising the confidence you get walking along the street with a big hat on. <laughs> so that's why the Pope is always so full of himself. <laughs> Though never in the police, Mrs Thatcher was so convinced of her abilities that in 1980 she had to be dissuaded by William Whitelaw from travelling to Leeds to take over the Yorkshire Ripper investigation personally. Can you imagine it? Chief Inspector Thatcher? Not so much softly, softly as madly, madly. <laughs> uh, Edwina, for radiant beauties for you. Her Majesty, <laughs> Frankenstein, <laughs> Eamon Andrews, and the lovely Bruce Forsyth. We wondered whether, or I wonder whether, uh, this is that got a royal we or a Thatcher <laughs> we or a <laughs> uh, whether this has got anything to do with a surgical change of any kind. I mean, if you look at Frankenstein and then you look at Ian, you think, of course, well, Ian hasn't done anything about his hair at all. But other than that... Yes. Are you suggesting, Edwina, that I look like the monster? <laughs> no. okay, will you sue me if I do? <laughs> no, I don't think you do. No, we'll leave the suing um, to you, um, Edwina. Bruce... You've always been a great sewer. Bruce Forsyth. <laughs> uh... Bruce Forsyth had something done to his hair. But you see, Margaret Thatcher started off as a blonde, a goofy, a, as a brunette. <laughs> <laughs> Am I anywhere near? You are on the right lines, actually, yes. It's Frankenstein, as all the others had their image moulded by Gordon Reese, uh, formerly a TV producer who went into image consultancy. According to uh, Reese, it's important uh, not to wear a lot of fuss on television. Scoop necklines are out, go easy on lots of jewellery. Advice which completely changed Eamon Andrews' career. <laughs> Uh, as for Mrs. Thatcher, part of Reese's contribution was to train her voice so that it lost its strident and grating quality. Could have fooled me. Uh, Derek, who's the uh, odd one out in this touching home movie? Mark Thatcher? Carol Thatcher? Her Eminence? And Dennis Thatcher? <laughs> well, of course, the obvious answer is that they're all odd. A bit too obvious, but unfortunately. A bit too obvious, that's mm. right. Sorry. Mm. There's only one woman there. <laughs> <laughs> You're narrowing it down, but... There's uh, only one person looking for a pub. <laughs> There's only one person... Who... <laughs> well, uh... There's only one person who always finds it. <laughs> <laughs> it is Dennis, so uh, I'll give you that much. Um, as all the others were present at the birth of Carol Thatcher. Uh, in fact, Carol and Mark were twins, although Mark turned up two minutes before Carol. Must have known a shortcut. <laughs> uh, Dennis, on the other hand, wasn't at the birth at all. Presumably another beer tasting festival in Devon. Uh, Ian, four like minds for you. The Pope. Humphrey Roberts. Roy Castle. And Oxford University. Well, I think this is um, people who turned Mrs Thatcher down. Or... <laughs> Not literally, obviously, I don't think the Pope offered, but, um... <laughs> that was Alan Clark. Uh, <laughs> Oxford University Allegedly. refused to give her a degree. Um, give her an honor degree. She actually mm -hmm. got a degree there. Roy Castle refused to meet her, um, because, um, 
she's working as a PR for a fag company now, which is a, a good job after you've been Prime Minister, Great Britain, selling fags. <laughs> now apparently she's involved in the non-tobacco side <laughs> of this fag company. Perhaps the bear did agree to meet her, because it's a teddy bear. It is, uh, it is the old one out, uh, Humphrey Roberts, uh, Mrs Thatcher's teddy bear, uh, because he's the only one uh, never to have snubbed her. Uh, apparently Mrs Thatcher was only the second person in history to be turned down for an honorary degree by Oxford University Dons, the other being President Bhutto of Pakistan, who was eventually hanged. Never, never realised universities had such powers. <laughs> Uh, on the Pope's trip to Britain, Mrs. Thatcher became the only head of state he ever refused to meet, which he said was because of the Falklands War. Haven't seen him rush back since it finished. <laughs> uh, all of which uh, relentless rudery brings us to the end of another round of uneducated guesswork, and the delicately poised situation is that Paul and Ed Wiener have a brave but inferior eight, whilst uh, Ian and Derek are getting dangerously close to smugness with twelve. And so we sail into uncharted territory once more as we welcome the debut appearance of our quickfire What Is She Talking About round? <laughs> question many of us have been asking for years. A bolus of Thatcher sound bites. Uh, all we want to know is to what is she referring? Historically, those who lie last go first. So, uh, Paul and Edwina, up to the starting blocks, please. And uh, what is she talking about? Well, they hurt. Um, they'd hurt anyone who had them. <laughs> Cigarettes, isn't it? <laughs> Is it rumbling ovaries? <laughs> like in the middle of the night? <laughs> Make that sort of noise. Keeping Dennis awake. What's that noise? Oh, it's only ovaries. <laughs> I think it's Paul Martin's rude quips. Um, I think it's far. just being people who are rude to her and rude remarks that are made about her. Mm, yes. And, yes. And in fact, she's not telling the truth because I don't think they did hurt her. I don't think she took any notice at all. She'd felt completely thick skin, and you could say, what the hell you like to her, and it wouldn't have made any difference. Mm -hmm. It is, uh, yes, critical remarks in the press is the, uh, is the oh. correct answer, so you can have that. Next. Beautiful, the purity of their whiteness. <laughs> Donny Osmond's teeth. <laughs> Michael Winner's underpants. <laughs> Zola Bud's legs. No, also not true. Snowdrops is, in fact, the answer that you weren't going to get. <laughs> Uh, snowdrops? I surprise you, Mr. I don't remember Arthur. a tax on snowdrops. <laughs> uh, next. Well, this is an absurd charge. It's an absurd charge? Is this when uh, Robin Day said to her during that notorious interview, you're a ruddy nutter lady? <laughs> Thinking the Belgrano? Something like it's that? It's not the poll tax, is it? Uh, the community charge, that was cool. So it's not the poll tax, uh, that's correct. Charge um, of the light brigade, was it? <laughs> <laughs> Is it ten pence going on a copy of Viz? <laughs> Uh, no, it isn't. It's uh, the absurd charge that the government is running down the health service, which is, of course, ludicrous, as we know. Um, and lastly... I hope so. <laughs> this is probably, a, judging by the vintage of the picture, this may well be when she was leader of the opposition and, uh, and was asked, you know, will you one, are you confident that one day you'll become Prime Minister, that sort of thing. Mm. And then Supreme Ruler of the Universe. Yeah. <laughs> That's the, it's a sensible answer, but it's not right, unfortunately. Any, um... When she was told well? that Neil Kinnock was favoured for leading the Labour Party? <laughs> <laughs> Make a sentence out of three words, so, hope, and I. <laughs> um, good answer, but not in fact true, that she's passionate, was, uh, was the question. Are you passionate? And she said, I hope so. So there we are. Um, <laughs> well, but not a very passionate answer, really. No, not you totally, you no. either say yes or no to that, don't you? I don't know, I've never been asked. I hope so. Are you passionate? Are you passionate? Yes. Are you passionate? No, I hope so. Um, <laughs> right, so Ian and Derek, here's your choice selection. Oh, I think I must have an enormous number. <laughs> it's her <our> ovaries. <laughs> Useless people in my cabinet. <laughs> Fat blokes called Nigel Lawson. <laughs> no, it's quite self-deprecating, really. It's false is the answer, which is rather surprising. She was thinking of the number naught. <laughs> Next. Uh, they're tiresome. And they're nine to one. She just been to watch Arsenal. 
Is she talking about Take That and the odds of them getting the Christmas single? <laughs> The cabinet again. Men in the cabinet. More jingoistic than that. Oh, the common market. Uh, the common market is a correct answer. Next. Quite often, I send them back because I think they're not well balanced. <laughs> got, got to be Tory MP. <laughs> uh, teeth was nearer. Scales. What do you do with teeth? Take them out. <laughs> I think most people eat with them. Take them out, I suppose. You pretend they're, they're hurting when there's a leadership like election on there. <laughs> <laughs> is it the meals that she served in the House of Commons canteen? Excellent. At Chequers, in fact. But yes, meals at Chequers is the right answer. And finally... I've had it every Tuesday and Thursday in the house <laughs> for four years. <laughs> yeah, but is it before or after question time? <laughs> ah, well, you've got the right answer. <laughs> Does that explain why she was always sort of so... Hi, during question time. It was quite remarkable to watch. You know, really energetic. She'd Perhaps Lord Helshin used to slip her one behind the speaker's chair. I think that's a terrible insult on Lord, Lord Helshin. Mm. <laughs> maybe that was why Geoffrey Howard looks so sleepy. Yeah. Well, you never know. <laughs> They'd be sort of just about to in Parliament, and suddenly it is rumbling, it'd be her ovaries. <laughs> Yes, um, I'll take you back to uh, Derek's answer, which was, I think, uh, the first one that mentioned question time. All of which uh, second guesswork brings to a juddering halt this special Thatcher special. And the terrible truth is that this week's deep fried chickens are Paul and Edwina with 12, and this week's perfect pizzas are Ian and Derek with 18. Uh, so, as a unique uh, prize for this week's extremely lucky winners, uh, we asked Harper Collins Limited for a copy of Margaret Thatcher's The Downing Street Years, and they said no. Uh, they did, however, agree to send us this delightful dust jacket, uh, which is lightweight, attractive, and contains about as much interesting reading as the book. Uh, so, there you are. That's your prize. Thank you very much. Uh, all that remains, then, is to say thank you to our panellists, Ian Hislop and Derek Hatton, Paul Merton and Edwina Curry. And I leave you with news that fashion experts have expressed surprise at the revelation that Dennis Thatcher gets his outfits from Vivian Westwood. <laughs> After the success of image doctors in teaching Mrs. Thatcher to speak, John Major hires one to teach him to walk. <laughs> and finally, you've bought the book, you've seen the TV programmes, now buy the album. <laughs> Join us next week when our guests will be Tony Hawkes and if he turns up, Roy Hattersley. Good night. <laughs>